69 hours later, I've finally finished playing Elden Ring for now. This game needs no introduction. Elden Ring is, at the time of recording this video, from Software's newest Dark Souls game, which at the time of its release printed the words you died on almost every gamer's screens. This game was God of War Ragnarok's fierce competition for the 2022 Game Awards, and it ended up taking home the coveted Game of the Year award. Now, the inner PlayStation fanboy in me wanted to scream robbery given how much I love God of War Ragnarok, but I knew that was a very ignorant thing to do, so I said to myself that I'll eventually play Elden Ring in order to say that I had the opportunity to play both games and make a fair comparison between them. Fast forward two whole years later and I've finally done it. I even stream myself playing it while also uploading videos of the best and worst parts of each stream. With that being said, this video will serve as the capstone for my Elden Ring journey, as far as you know it at least, because I'm still playing this game with another character. Without further ado, let's get into it. I offer you an accord. A Honda Accord? Let me start off by saying that I have never played a Dark Souls or Souls-like game before, so I didn't know what to expect besides the game being incredibly difficult. My mentality was that if all these YouTubers and streamers who have never touched a Dark Souls game before can beat Elden Ring, what's stopping me from doing the same thing? Little did I know, I was about to embark on an adventure that would become one of my favorite experiences in any game I've ever played. Playing this game for myself made me understand the hype for this game and the other Soulsborne games that came before it. This game begins with the character creation menu where I kid you not, I spent a good hour or so making what was essentially the opposite of Kratos. Instead of pale skin, I gave him charcoal skin. Instead of having a beard, I made him clean shaven. And rather than having a bald head, I gave him a head full of white hair along with a bunch of body hair. Once you finally customize your character's appearance only for you to realize later on that most of it's going to be covered with armor anyways, you finally start your journey by dying to a boss. They deliberately do this to prepare you for what's going to happen throughout the majority of your playthrough. Anywho, you get taken to the tutorial area where they make you fight the strongest character in all of the Elden Ring lore at 0.01% of their power for the sake of having a chance to get past the tutorial. From there, you take the lift up and open the door to Limgrave where you actually start your adventure. Now here's, here's the thing. thing, From Software doesn't actually tell you what to do or where to go. Once you enter Limgrave, you're free to do whatever you want and go wherever you want. Is there a story? Sure, as a matter of fact, the quote-unquote campaign is actually quite linear, however chances are that you will not follow this linear path. First and foremost because the game doesn't tell you where to go, so you have to figure it out on your own which can be rather challenging and dare I say a little off-putting if you're doing a blind playthrough considering how massive the open world is. The second reason is because if you choose to head straight to Margit on your first playthrough without any exploration, you may be part of the 30-something percent that gets filtered by him because you were underleveled, especially if you picked Wretch as your starting class but more on those later. What I first want to talk about is the story itself. Now if you just played the game and only experienced the story through the game, you'll be confused like I was. Essentially what happened is that Queen Merica got mad that her son died and decided to screw up the whole world by destroying the Elden Ring. This event is known as the Shattering and it set the lands between, the area where this game takes place, into turmoil. So what the heck is the Elden Ring and why is it so important? Well, the Elden Ring is basically the ultimate plot device that essentially established order in the lands between because again, it's a plot device. This plot device was housed in another plot device called the Erd Tree, and that plot device was able to use the plot device I mentioned earlier to bless the lands between with the grace of the Elden Ring. So basically, this plot device plus that plot device equals no plot, hence why one of these plot devices got destroyed so that our journey can begin. So what do we do? Well, we're considered tarnished, which is a slur for those who have been marked unworthy by the previously mentioned plot devices. However, you being the main character, you say, how about I do anyway, and go about becoming Elden Lord. Now, how do we become Elden Lord? Well, we gotta collect these things called Great Runes, which are basically just fragments of the Shattered Elden Ring. We then use these Great Runes to mend the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord, despite us being destined not to. Seems pretty simple, right? Shit. Yeah, this is a From Software game. Shit ain't easy. But eventually, you do make it to the end and you are able to mend the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. But this being a From Software game, this isn't the only ending this game has. Technically, there are six endings to this game, but four of them are basically a slightly altered version of the same ending, so there's three different endings for the game. The first one being the Elden Lord ending, where despite whichever variant of the ending you get, you don't really solve the problems in the lands between. 
The two plot devices still have control of everything, and all you got was some street cred like some GTA San Andreas mission. As a matter of fact, once you get your 15 seconds of fame on the throne, you're back to business. The second ending is the Age of Stars ending, which requires you to complete Ronnie the Witch's questline before reaching the end of the main story. This is considered by many as the quote unquote good ending, because Ronnie essentially ushers in a new age of free will that is no longer bound by the plot devices mentioned earlier. But if you ask me, this just seems like the simp ending, because you do all of the work and Ronnie is the one that benefits from it all. Then we get to my favorite ending, the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending. As you can see, this is the bad ending. I usually don't like bad endings in games because they're either very obviously not canon or the good ending is just better. But the frenzied flame ending in Elden Ring not only sees you, the main character, get the credit you deserve for your hard work, but there's also closure with this ending. You burned everything and everyone. That's it. Is it the best solution to the problem presented to us in this game? Obviously not because that's Ronnie's ending. However, this is an effective solution which is good enough for me. Overall, Elden Ring's story is great on its own but even better if you actually take the time to immerse yourself in the game's lore. This can be done through several means. The primary ones are playing through all of the side content this game has to offer, as well as a simple Google search for those who like to read, or a YouTube search for those that like looking, looking at pictures, pictures with some audio. Considering that George R.R. R. Martin, the dude that wrote Game of Thrones, also wrote the story for this game, you can tell that they were cooking. And the music! My goodness, when you launch this game for the first time, you hear the subtle beginning to the main theme. And then you get hit with That's the only indicator you need to know that an epic adventure awaits. And that's just the main menu theme. Wait until you hear some of these boss battle themes. Oh my goodness. Similar to other games I've reviewed, the music in this game is able to set the tone for whatever scene it's used in. And that goes a very long way. Anyways, enough about me gushing over music, my recommendation is to play through all of the main and side content of the game in order to get the full Elden Ring experience because the story is only a small part of what makes this game special. Ladies and gentlemen, I may suck at transitions, but it's time to talk about gameplay. Just like other great YouTubers, I'm also going to split the gameplay into combat and the things you do outside of combat, starting with the latter. As I mentioned in my story synopsis, once you open the door to Limgrave, the game just says go. They don't say where to go, what to do there, or even how to get there. You kinda just have to figure it out on your own. And good fucking luck doing that on your first playthrough because this game's map is yidge. That's coming from a guy whose favorite game prior to playing this one included 8 massive playable areas. Okay, technically it was 4 plus 4 smaller explorable areas, but you know. Keep in mind that this map I'm showing here doesn't even include the multiple explorable areas underground, as well as all of the caves, catacombs, graves, and dungeons scattered across the map. Needless to say, you'll spend quite a bit of time maneuvering across the map. Luckily for you, there's no need to walk across the whole thing because early in the game you get a spectral steed, Torrent. Not only can you ride Torrent, but you can also fight on horseback which is actually pretty effective in this game. On top of that, Torrent can double jump which you'll definitely need when doing parkour. If only I could double jump in certain parkour sections of this game. My terrible sense of verticality aside, while exploring the many areas to discover, there's also a bunch of quests that you can do for certain characters. They vary in length, and more often than not, the person you're doing a quest for will end up dying. Nonetheless, unlike other games that just have side content for the sake of having additional content in their game that doesn't even reward anything good, Elden Ring makes side quests almost feel mandatory. Especially if you want to learn more about the game's lore, and most importantly, if you want some of the best loot in the game. Take the Shard of Alexander Talisman for for example, easily one of the best talismans in the entire game that is obtained from a quest that you can start right from the beginning, which will go on until you reach Fire Mazula. That's basically towards the end of the main story. If you focus primarily on beating the main story, you will miss out on things such as the Bull Goat armor set, the Rotten Wig Sword Insignia talisman, and arguably the best rune farming spot in the entire game. However, there are some quests that are really just tedious more than anything, and either don't give great rewards or just don't make any sense at all. I know it's not encouraging to kill any NPCs in this game, but some of these quest lines make me think that exceptions can be made. Those lame NPC quests aside, I had a great time playing through the other NPC quests, and most definitely 
probably use the loot that was obtained through them. The only thing I wish this game had was some kind of tracker for all of these quests because there's over 30 different NPCs with their own quest line and it ain't easy keeping track of all of them. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if I did all of them throughout my main playthrough nor my new game plus playthrough. At least I did the ones with the loot I wanted because that's all that matters in this game, especially when it comes to combat. Okay, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to this game's combat so you better go refill your snacks and drinks now before I begin. All refilled? Alright, let's dive into the rabbit hole that is Elden Ring's combat. In order to understand combat, we first need to talk about you, the main character. More importantly, your stats. Unlike other games where the only number in your stats that counts is your overall level, all of your stats count in Elden Ring. This is because there are tons of weapons and armor in Elden Ring which allow for countless build possibilities. This not only makes the game replayable, but it also allows a wider audience of players to experience the game since they can make a build that suits their playstyle. However, in order to create those particular builds, you need to level up your stats in a particular way. There are classes in this game, but honestly, those are just different stat distributions to help you get started with a particular build from the get-go. If you're like me who can't decide which build you want to go for, you can pick the Wretch class, which has an even stat distribution. Certain stats are required to wield certain weapons, and that's kind of the basis of how your builds will go. For example, in my first playthrough, I used the Greatsword, which scales with strength, because big sword do big damage. The objective is to level the stats which scale best with the weapon of choice for your build. Another example I'll use is the infamous Rivers of Blood Katana which I used for another playthrough I did off stream. This weapon's effectiveness scales with dexterity and arcane which means I should level those stats in order to maximize the effectiveness of the Rivers of Blood. You get the gist of it. Armor has their own separate stats independent of the ones you level up but some pieces of armor can give a bonus to the stats associated with your level such as the Okina Mask which adds 5 dexterity. Just keep in mind that whatever you equip has a weight to it, which affects your equip load. Wow, kind of like real life, eh? Pay close attention to this text right here to see what kind of load you're carrying. Whatever you do, make sure it doesn't say heavy because that affects your movement in combat. <laughs> Unlike other games I've reviewed in the past, armor cannot be leveled up, so you get what you get. Weapons on the other hand can be leveled up using smithing stones. There are two types of smithing stones in this game, regular smithing stones and somber smithing stones. Regular smithing stones are more abundant and are used to upgrade most weapons in the game, albeit you need a lot of them, whereas somber smithing stones are used to upgrade specific weapons and are usually harder to find. My recommendation is that regardless of which type of stone you need, you should go about finding all of the bell bearings for the smithing stones so you you can buy them at the round table hold. This game also has talismans to further spice up your build. Like I mentioned before, some of the best talismans in the game require you to do a bit of exploring and or completing a quest. However, a single talisman can turn a good build into a great one. For example, the Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman makes it so that you deal extra damage once you proc blood loss on an enemy, which paired with a bleed weapon like, I don't know, the Rivers of Blood Katana can lead to big damage. To summarize, level up certain stats to use a certain weapon, upgrade said weapon with smithing stones and use armor that complements your build whether it's from a practical or fashion perspective. Then you get the talismans to really get your build going. Now you're ready to fight or read the words you died over and over again. But why is that? Well this is a souls game which means the combat in this game is actually hard. Let's break it down shall we? First of all I want to take a moment to talk about the questionable controls in this game. This button is responsible for sprinting and dodging while this button is responsible for lock on, switching lock on, and moving the camera. The Dodge and sprinting being mapped to the same button ended up not being as problematic, but whoever decided to map the camera movement to the same control as the lock-on switch needs to be questioned, because this is the absolute worst thing to have when fighting a group of enemies. No, don't lock on. My obvious skill issue aside, besides the enemy's health bar, you have three health bars that you need to worry about. Your red bar is your health that increases with your vigor stat, your blue bar is the FP which increases with your mind stat, and your green bar is the stamina which increases with your endurance stat. Now the health bar is health very straightforward. If this bar empties, you died. The FP bar is your mana, which is most important if you're a dirty spellcasting wizard. It's also what you use for sorceries and incantations as well as Ashes of War, which are basically like special moves. 
The health and FP bars are replenished with flasks. You can allocate which type of flask you are equipped with, as well as increase the total number of flasks, as well as how much a flask can replenish via golden seeds and sacred tears scattered across the map. Then you got the stamina bar, which is what you gotta manage the most in fights, because this rechargeable bar is consumed when you attack, sprint, jump, and dodge. Basically any movement besides walking. Poor management of your stamina will get you killed more often than not, so in other words, you actually have to think when fighting rather than just spam. On top of having to think while in combat, some of these enemies have absurd movesets that do insane amounts of damage regardless of your build. This deadly combination is what makes the game difficult, in my opinion. Now, there are things such as summons and blatantly overpowered weapons and builds which can make the game easier, but for the most part you're severely punished even for the slightest of mistakes. This is nothing new for Dark Souls players, and some of them even go the distance by not relying on things such as summons that make the game slightly easier. However, for most players who haven't touched a Dark Souls game before, they struggled a lot. Some of them even go out of their way to complain about the game being difficult and no difficulty option in sight. If you ask me, I think this approach to difficulty is a good thing. Not only does it test the player, but it also teaches them a valuable life lesson. There's no switch that instantly makes things easier whenever you're faced with a challenge. Yes, you can get help along the way, but you ultimately have to face that challenge. That's just a more meaningful way of saying get ready to die a bunch if you want to make it through this game. As long as you make a bit of progress with each attempt, not only will it be worth it, but it'll be all the more satisfying once you finally overcome that obstacle. This is perfectly demonstrated with arguably the best parts about this whole game, the boss fights. Elden Ring took everything I knew about bosses and turned it upside down. There's a quote unquote strategy for beating these bosses, but it's much easier said than done. Regardless of gear, regardless of level, the bosses in Elden Ring require patience, as well as precise timing with your attacks and dodges. Sometimes it feels like a contest to see who can punish who the most, and these bosses are very unforgiving. They can easily catch you off guard if you're overconfident in your attack windows and can give you no chance to attack if you lack confidence in those attack windows. You best be ready to die a bunch because these bosses are literally Einstein's definition of insanity, trying the same thing over and over again expecting a different result. Luckily for you, this ain't physics class. You actually should keep trying because with every attempt, you do what I like to call downloading the moveset of the boss. Not to mention that some of the bosses in this game are just really fucking cool, some of my favorites being Radon, Malekith, Godfrey, and Radagon. Their lore, fighting style, and music that plays throughout these fights, on top of the challenges that come with them, make these boss fights some of the best boss fights I've ever fought, period. However, there's also some less than fun bosses to fight. For me, it was Renala, the Elden Beast, and Rykard, which I don't have footage for. For Rykard, it's mainly because you're given a weapon to beat him, which makes the boss fight trivial, but for the other two, they're the worst kinds of enemies to fight in the game. All they do is run away and shoot stuff at you. It's even worse for the Elden Beast because... That's literally the final boss for the game and it's the second face to Radagon who I literally just said is one of my favorite bosses. But that's all fine because nothing could possibly prepare me for the true final boss of Elden Ring. You know what, I'll let her introduce herself. Melania was the last boss I fought not only in my first playthrough but also in my New Game Plus run where I used no summons. Beating her the second time was the last thing I did in Elden Ring period. Why is that? Well, it's because in a game known for being hard, she was and still is the hardest boss in the game. 
Fighting her without summons demands damn near perfection when it comes to managing stamina, avoiding her attacks, and making the most of your attack windows. The thing with Melania is that she doesn't attack you until you attack her. She's basically a counterpuncher which is one of the worst people to spar with because you're the one that has to make a move. And then when you get her down to 75% HP, she starts doing arguably the most controversial move I done ever seen a boss fight do. The waterfowl dance. Good fucking luck dodging this shit. No matter how many YouTube tutorials I watch, no matter how many times I tried, I cannot fully avoid the waterfowl. As a matter of fact, I had to completely change my build come my new game plus run in order to increase my chances of surviving the waterfowl alone. And that's just phase one of the boss fight. When you get to phase two, Melania reveals her final form and goes full aggro on you with even more moves to insta kill you with, including an even more powerful waterfowl dance. Are you kidding me? This fight will make you rage, it will make you question life, and it will make you regret playing this game. But if you persevere, if you keep trying, if you never give up, and show a bit of progress with each Melania run, you'll eventually beat her. I'm sure that like other players, defeating certain bosses felt satisfying. However, nothing compares to the feeling of beating Melania for the first time. It's a feeling which cannot be replicated that only 33% of all Elden Ring players have felt. As cringe as it sounds, Melania taught me the importance of never backing down from a challenge. She taught me to believe in myself, and she really pushed me to the limits of my skill in this game. This is how the ultimate boss fight in any game should make you feel. You should be able to beat that boss and then finally go outside to watch the sunrise on your front porch. From being a maidenless tarnish to overcoming the ultimate challenge the game has to offer and everything in between, Elden Ring is indeed a game of all time. As a matter of fact, I think it's safe to say that it is now my new favorite game of all time, and we still got the DLC for the game on the way. As someone who has never played a Dark Souls game prior, I can safely say that this game is a great game to start with, and that seems to be the general consensus within the Soulsborne community. It's as addicting as it is rewarding, and I even went out of my way to get all of the achievements for it. If you haven't played it already, I highly recommend you do before the DLC comes out. But that's going to conclude my somewhat lengthy review of Elden Ring. I hope you enjoyed me rambling about this game because I definitely enjoyed writing and recording this review. As for what's next, I've been playing Yakuza Kiwami on the side, albeit I took a break from that game because of how addicted I was to Elden Ring. Now, the logical thing to do is complete Yakuza Kiwami along with the other Yakuza games in my Steam library for the sake of my wallet. Yet the From Software hype is really tempting me to get into another one. Don't blame me, blame Miyazaki for making great games. If I suddenly buy Sekiro and play that game for the next month, it's because of him. Not that I'd actually do such a thing. Oh. Let's do this.